I would have loved to hear from each one of you, uh, but not only uh, do I want to share some insights with you, some ideas, uh, some information and some analysis, uh, but I also want to show you a brief video <laughs> and I want us to have a brief discussion about that video afterwards, okay? So, and I only get like, I have one hour, right, with you all, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, so, um, you already know my name, Nada, right? Nada Mustafa Ali. My uh, first language is Arabic. Uh, and I want to assure you that in Arabic, Nada does not mean nothing. <laughs> it means generosity. And it also uh, means uh, the morning dew, you know, the, the dew, the drops of water that you find on flowers, for example, in the morning. Okay, so my name doesn't mean uh, nothing. <laughs> and uh, I am originally from Sudan. Uh, it's a country in Northeast Africa. Uh, it is a former uh, British colony. We, we achieved our political independence in 1956. And uh, since 1956, um, you know, our system of governance has changed several times from democratically elected governments to um, uh, military and dictatorial governments. And um, various military regimes actually um, use um, force, obviously, to oppress the people of Sudan. Uh, since uh, 2009, actually from 2000, sorry, from uh, 1989 uh, up to uh, 2019, uh, we had a political regime in power uh, which used religion to oppress uh, the people of Sudan and especially women, you know, by restricting uh, our movement and uh, introducing or imposing a certain dress code and so on. Um, and, um, you know, that regime actually arrested political activists um, tortured uh, political activists, um, uh, imprisoned uh, women and men um, who uh, expressed dissident views. And um, so during these 30 years, many um, of the Sudanese uh, women uh, who were not necessarily uh, really interested in becoming organized or, um, you know, subscribing to uh, ideas and issues around um, bringing about change and, um, you know, ensuring uh, respect for human rights, uh, gender equality, and meaningful participation of women, uh, decided to become active, actually. And so there was so much resistance to this regime until uh, after uh, an uprising, which started in December 2018, the regime was overthrown. And so now uh, in Sudan, we have a transitional government in power. Uh, women's participation is still uh, not that great, um, but at the same time, uh, you know, we have hope that this uh, is going to be a conducive uh, environment for uh, women to organize and to start uh, changing gender relationships and to challenge the ideology of what you refer to in countries in Latin America as the ideology of machismo, right? And so, and so as a result, um, so many people in Sudan, you know, the majority of the population are really interested in the issue of human rights. Um, you know, uh, various communities have experienced war. You might have heard about the war in Darfur in 2003, and uh, it started in 2003, and uh, it had a really devastating um, impact on communities in Darfur, especially women who uh, were, you know, were exposed to rape, um, and other forms of violence as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just gave you this background, brief background, uh, so as to emphasize the fact that many people um, in uh, Sudan became committed to, uh, you know, uh, activism around uh, human rights and including women's rights and gender equality as a way of survival, you know, during the past regime. And we continue to have uh, quite a, a, a strong women's movement um, you know, uh, that that is working and that is campaigning to ensure that we achieve gender equality and women's human rights. Uh, another reason I uh, shared with you this background is to say that in many ways, what we uh, teach 
uh, in the classroom as uh, professors of women's gender and sexuality studies is actually, and, and what we research as well, what we carry out research on um, is actually rooted in uh, community and it is rooted in, um, you know, uh, the experiences of women and um, uh, it's rooted in uh, our attempt to understand gender inequality in Sudan, in Africa, and also in other parts of the world. Uh, my, uh, I said earlier that my first language is Arabic, but it's not my mother tongue. My mother tongue is a Nubian language, you know. Uh, I am originally from Nubia. <laughs> you know, we have somebody whose name is Nubia here. And, uh, you know, uh, this is an ancient African civilization, um, by the way. And uh, one of its features was, uh, you know, the fact that there were many, uh, there were several um, uh, queens, warrior queens, such as Amani Tori, Amani Rinas, and Amani Shehtu. And they either ruled directly or indirectly through their male kin. And also in our uh, more recent history, we have many uh, examples, you know, of women uh, who were organized, you know, and women's organization and the women's movement started as part of anti-colonial uh, resistance in Sudan. And this obviously shaped the nature of the women's uh, movement in Sudan. Women in general played important roles in Sudan. They continue to play important roles in African countries, in the Middle East, in Latin America, and obviously in the global north as well. But oftentimes our histories, our stories, our narratives are excluded from the official record. So you don't find many such stories in written books, for example. Um, you know, but recently this is uh, changing, of course. Um, another reason I'm sharing this information with you is that uh, communities in the global south are oftentimes constructed as uh, victims and especially women, you know. Uh, for example, in um, global media discourses. Uh, and so, uh, although we have this rich history in Sudan, and although, of course, Sudanese women, as I said earlier, and uh, women also in other countries, for example, in Africa and the Middle East, um, and I'm sure in Latin American countries, face many challenges, and these are important to document and to challenge, including by local activists and women's organizations and researchers. It is important that as we do so, uh, we uh, avoid subscribing to any notions of a single story about any place, right? Because our countries are very heterogeneous and even the U.S. itself is very heterogeneous. I said, uh, uh, you know, there are uh, women in the United States, for example, um, women of color, um, migrant women, uh, you know, women uh, workers, for example women who are um, marginalized in, any, in other ways, uh, who face many challenges, right? Uh, but still, we shouldn't really think about these women and these communities as only as victims, right? Um, when we think about, uh, you know, Latin American countries and, and, and try to uh, think about human rights and women's human rights there, we oftentimes refer to the, you know, we use the term machismo, right? Uh, and again, women, uh, this is an ideology that affects women and communities in negative ways. But this is not the only aspect of women's uh, experiences, right, in Latin American countries, because I know that women's uh, movement in different countries, including in your country, uh, are extremely uh, uh, strong, right? And I want you to challenge that if you think this is not correct. And also, um, there are many, uh, you know, uh, theorists and feminist scholars um, who write about women's rights in Latin America, for example. And so we need to document and think about these challenges, but we also need to document uh, and, and share stories about women who are activists, uh, women who are um, really engaged in researching and theorizing about feminism. The, you know, like fe uh, feminist scholars from Latin America have contributed immensely to the development of feminist uh, theory and um, also in terms of uh, human rights activisms, as uh, I'm sure you know better than I do. And that's why uh, later on, I'm going to show a brief video uh, by a Nigerian uh, novelist. Her name is uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. 
and she gave a really important TED talk since you are into videos in this class, right? Watching a lot of YouTubes. Um, and the title of that talk was uh, The Dangers of a Single Story. And I want you to uh, watch it and then maybe we can have a brief conversation about it afterwards. So in terms of my journey, I uh, studied, uh, you know, as you know, from the introduction, political science in Sudan. And then I did my master's at the American University in uh, Cairo. Um, you know, uh, my, my friends uh, call me a nerd, you know, all the time. But uh, I really en I, I enjoy reading and I enjoy studying. And I um, really appreciate the fact that you are uh, interested in learning um, or in even improving your English. Um, and one thing I want to uh, maybe share with you is that one way to really, um, you know, uh, if you want to learn a language well, um, read extensively. Okay, so read in your own um, field, obviously, regardless of the field itself, but also read in extensively, read novels, um, you know, read in other uh, disciplines and fields. And not only will you have fun, you know, you will enjoy your time, obviously, reading this material, but you will also, um, you know, expand your knowledge about the uh, culture and also about um, the place, you know, you are trying to learn about. If any of you uh, decides to come over to Boston or if you are already based in Boston, there is a really wonderful organization called Grub Street. And this is really a writing, a creative writing, um, you know, uh, organization. It's based in um, uh, back near Back Bay. Um, and uh, what they do is they teach short courses um, about uh, writing. If you are if you are a poet, for example, if you write in your own in, uh, language and you want to publish and write in English, this is an organization that you can actually uh, reach out to. I want to show you some of the books about writing that I really enjoy. Uh, and, and reading, obviously, that I enjoy reading. I like to read books about reading, by the way. And so I don't know whether you have already seen this book before, but it's called On Writing Well by William uh, Zisner. It's really amazing. You, can, you will um, enjoy reading it and you will learn a lot from this book. Uh, this is another book, Writing to Change the World, for those of you who are interested in uh, human rights um, and human rights activism. This is a, a book about uh, academic writing. It's called Stylish Academic Writing by Helen Sword, who also wrote another really interesting book. Uh, and it is called Air and Light and Time and Space. I really enjoyed reading this book. I almost felt guilty reading it during my work time, <laughs> working hours, you know. Uh, I don't know whether any of you has read any of uh, Stephen King's um, novels, but he also wrote a book about writing. It's just called On Writing. Uh, and then if you are really interested in speaking, there is this book. It is called uh, How to Develop Self-Confidence and Influence People by Public Speaking. I found this book in my late father's library, actually, when I was uh, still an undergraduate student at the University of Khartoum. There was one year uh, where the university was closed for political purposes, you know, there was political instability. And so I had to spend hours and hours at home. At the time, we only uh, were able to watch TV in the evening, you know, like from maybe four o'clock until 11. Uh, of course, there was no internet <laughs> at all. So, and I love reading anyway, so I read everything really I found. And this is this was one of the books I found in my late father's library. Uh, he uh, got when he um, came to the United States uh, in the 1960s uh, uh, to study at Wisconsin University. And so it is really, really interesting. Again, you will learn, um, you know, some of the strategies for public speaking, but at the same time, uh, you will also learn a lot about the culture itself and you will also enjoy yourself. There is poetry here, there are stories, there are there is history and so on and so forth. Uh, the reason I'm sharing uh, these books with you and the reason I'm uh, sharing this uh, information with you is that the video you are going to watch by Chimamand Ngozi Adichie um, is one where she reflects critically, you know, 
on reading uh, books in other cultures as, as a child, okay? And what I want you to uh, pay attention to is what she talks about when she, when she, um, uh, when she discusses the dangers of a single story. But um, what she is saying uh, should not discourage you from reading books in English, um, you know, and reading books about reading and writing in English, because that's one of the reasons she is such a good writer. She wrote many novels. Has anyone read a novel or a short story um, by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie? Raise your, use the reactions. Okay, so. She is originally from Nigeria, but oh, Nubia, you've read which which um, book or or story have you read? I, I read. Uh, I, I I think the name in English is Purple Hibiscus. It's a novel. Uh, it's one of the first novels. It's very beautiful and short. Sure, it's not too big, so you should read if you can. I, I love it. I love her really. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I love um, you know Purple Hibiscus, and there is another book. Uh, I want to suggest that you read it's called uh, Half of a Yellow Sun and it is about the Biafra war in Nigeria you know it was a, a war that took, that happened after independence and um, it, it is connected obviously to human rights if you want to learn about human rights uh, in Africa and the lack thereof uh, try to read uh, this book as well I uh, read it while in Benue state I was doing research there in 2007 and they asked, uh, you know, uh, about the best books in, um, oh, somebody wrote, yeah, Half of a Yellow Sun. Uh, and also, sorry, I have think, you read uh, this book? and also, all, all, should be, all Should Be Feminists are, are one of their books, no? And it's very, very yes. cool. Yes, and this is a very accessible book about feminism. You know, obviously, feminism is very diverse. There are many theories about feminism and what it means. It means different things to different people. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is an accessible book that people can read as well. That's excellent. Okay. Um, uh, so before we watch the video together, uh, I want to uh, define some words uh, that I usually use in my teaching and in my research. Um, one is the, the word gender. Anybody knows what gender means? Or maybe and I want to reframe my question. What does gender mean? What is the translation of gender in your in Spanish? How do you translate it into Spanish? Frank? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's género. Can you say that again? Género? Género, yeah. Okay. Is this a, a, like a, a word that uh, maybe feminists or um, uh, mm -hmm. scholars coined? Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Yes. Estudios de género is uh, used commonly in the Spanish speaking world. We'll go ahead, Frank. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, gender obviously is, uh, uh, you know, we need to uh, differentiate gender from sex. Sex is about biological difference, right, or differences. Gender is uh, socially and culturally constructed, you know. It's a social and, gen uh, and uh, cultural construct of the difference between the sexes. Right. It is also the roles and responsibilities that societies allocate to their male and female members. It's a power relationship and also it is an analytical tool which I use to examine and study gender inequality, as I said earlier, but also I use it to challenge gender inequality. Um, Another word uh, I want you to, I want to ask whether you know and whether there is a translation for it in Spanish as well is intersectionality. Nubia, you are nodding your head. Do you know the translation into Spanish? Yes, in Spanish it's named interseccionalidad. Oh, wonderful. Thank <laughs> you. In Arabic, it is al <laughs> And it is just a literal, uh, translation, Frank, you look a little surprised, right? <laughs> Are you? Why is that the case? Um, because I had never listened to that term before. I get that a lot, you know, even when I start teaching, um, you know, uh, about gender and intersectionality, uh, students, some of the students tell me that this is the first time that they have uh, heard or learned about this concept. And that was particularly the case, you know, between 20, 
2011, 2012, and 2015, you know. Uh, in recent years, it became more popular in uh, feminist activism and also in fem gender, women's, and sexuality studies. And um, it is basically uh, a term which um, an American legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, coined in 1989 uh, to refer to uh, the fact that it is not just gender that determines women's experiences of inequality, oppression, uh, privilege, right, uh, or resistance. Uh, she was arguing that, no, we should not just talk about gender. We have to think and talk about um, race and ethnicity. We have to think and write about social class. We have to think and write about uh, different ability, right? Uh, legal status, whether, whether one is an immigrant or a refugee or an asylum seeker, and other aspects of difference as well, okay? So that's what intersectionality refers to. It is no longer possible to just talk about gender relations without referring to other aspects of difference. These all shape women's experiences. And I don't want to tell you the story about intersectionality because this way we will not have enough time, uh, you know, the origins of intersectionality. Uh, because this, um, you know, this way we won't have time to watch uh, at least part of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's vid video and to talk, um, you know, briefly about it. Uh, so um, I think I'm going to show you the video now and then afterwards maybe we can think about other concepts or just discuss the content of the video. But please pay attention to the fact that although it's important to avoid falling into the trap of single stories about any place, uh, it is also important to uh, read extensively in any language you are interested in. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Sorry about the ad, everybody. I'm a storyteller. Can um, you hear the video? I would like to tell you a few personal stories. Yes what I like to yeah. call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in Eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader, and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read. <laughs> I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <clears throat> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. <laughs> now this, despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, I had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow, we ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of ginger beer because the characters in the British books I read drank ginger beer. Never mind that I had no idea what ginger beer was. <laughs> and for many years afterwards, I would have a desperate desire to taste ginger beer. But that is another story. What this demonstrates, I think, is how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, particularly as children. Because all I had read were books in which characters were foreign, I had become convinced that books, by their very nature, had to have foreigners in them and had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. Now, things changed when I discovered African books. There weren't many of them available, and they weren't quite as easy to find as the foreign books. But because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Laye, I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose kinky hair could not form ponytails, could also exist in literature. I started to write about things I recognized. Now, I loved those American and British books I read. They stirred my imagination, they opened up new worlds for me. But the unintended consequence was that I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. So what the discovery of African writers did for me was this. It saved me 
from having a single story of what books are. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new house boy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> she assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came out, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in India, Africa, and other countries. So after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, had seen Fide's family. This single story of Africa ultimately comes, I think, from Western literature. Now, here's a quote from the writing of a London merchant called John Locke, who sailed to West Africa in 1561 and kept a fascinating account of his voyage. After referring to the Black Africans as beasts who have no houses, he writes, they are also people without heads, having their mouths and eyes in their breasts. Now, I've laughed every time I've read this, and one must admire the imagination of John Locke. But what is important about his writing is that it represents the beginning of a tradition of telling African stories in the West, a tradition of sub-Saharan Africa as a place of negatives, of difference, of darkness, of people who, in the words of the wonderful poet, <coughs> Rudyard Kipling, are half devil, half child. And so I began to realize that my American roommate must have, throughout her life, seen and heard different versions of this single story. As had a professor who once told me that my novel was not authentically African. Now, I was quite willing to contend that there were a number of things wrong with the novel, that it had failed, 
in a number of places. But I had not quite imagined that it had failed at achieving something called African authenticity. In fact, I did not know what African authenticity was. The professor told me that my characters were too much like him, an educated and middle-class man. My characters drove cars. They were not starving. Therefore, they were not authentically African. But I must quickly add that I too am just as guilty on the question of the single story. A few years ago, I visited Mexico from the US. The political climate in the US at the time was tense and there were debates going on about immigration. And as often happens in America, immigration became synonymous with Mexicans. There were endless stories of Mexicans as people who were fleecing the healthcare system, sneaking across the border, being arrested at the border, that sort of thing. I remember walking around on my first day in Guadalajara, watching the people going to work, rolling up to tears in the marketplace, smoking, laughing. I remember first feeling slight surprise, and then I was overwhelmed with shame. I realized that I had been so immersed in the media coverage of Mexicans that they had become one thing in my mind, the abject immigrant. I had bought into the single story of Mexicans and I could not have been more ashamed of myself. So that is how to create a single story, show a people as one thing, as only one thing over and over again, and that is what they become. It is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There is a word, an Igbo word, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world, and it is Nkali. It's a noun that loosely translates to, to be greater than another. Like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of Nkali. How they are told, who tells them, when they are told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. The Palestinian poet Murid Baghouti writes that if you want to dispossess a people, the simplest way to do it is to tell their story and to start with secondly. Start the story with the arrows of the Native Americans and not with the arrival of the British, and you have an entirely different story. Start the story with the failure of the African state and not with the colonial creation of the African state and you have an entirely different story. I recently spoke at a university where a student told me that it was such a shame that Nigerian men was, were <coughs> physical abusers like the father character in my novel. I told him that I had just read a novel called American Psycho. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that it was such a shame that young Americans were serial murderers. <laughs> no, no. Now, obviously I said this in a fit of mild irritation, but <laughs> it would never have occurred to me to think that just because I had read a novel in which a character was a serial killer, that he was somehow representative of all Americans. And now this is not because I'm a better person than that student, but because of America's cultural and economic power, I had many stories of America. I had read Thailand, Updike, and Steinberg, and Bitskill. I did not have a single story of America. When I learned some years ago that writers were expected to have had really unhappy childhoods to be successful, I began to think about how I could invent horrible things my parents had done to me. But the truth is that I had a very happy childhood, full of laughter and love in a very close-knit family. But I also had grandfathers who died in refugee camps. My cousin, Polly, died because he could not get adequate health care. One of my closest friends, Ukuloma, died in a plane crash because our fire trucks did not have water. I grew up under repressive military governments that devalued education so that sometimes my parents were not paid their salaries. And so as a child, I saw jam disappear from the breakfast table. Then margarine disappeared. Then bread became too expensive. Then milk became rationed. And most of all, a kind of 
normalized political fear invaded our lives. All of these stories make me who I am. But to insist on only these negative stories is to flatten my experience and to overlook the many other stories that formed me. Okay, so I am going to stop the video here, uh, but I'm going to place the link. Um, or later I will share it with uh, Hector, okay, the, the link. So you can watch it in your own time if interested. So we have about, uh, I think, seven or eight minutes. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fariz. Uh, I want you to give some reflection about this video, what you think about it. You know, just a few words. Uh, Frank, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that it's true. Like she said that we made just one story about someone. And sometimes we need to open our minds and to, you know, just take um, consideration of all the things that happens around some countries or some persons. And it's really important to reflect about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we need to question really what we hear, what we see and so on. Thank you. Who else? I can also ask specific questions, but why don't you just reflect about your thoughts? Nubia, I see, oh, okay. So Tipsy, go ahead. And then Larry. Yes, <clears throat> what, I, uh, what I saw in that video is that it's true. We have one story and we think that's uh, the general rule. Uh, we think that's the story of, uh, of a country maybe. And no, that's maybe that may, that history is maybe true. Uh, it will be true, but it's not the, it's not the general life in that country. So I think uh, we, uh, as, you, as you said, we have to learn and we have to read and we have to know about uh, other countries, but we can keep just one story. We have to search for more and we have to uh, show the world with more, with our eyes more uh, open. Excellent, thank you. And to think critically about messages, right? Thank you, thank you very much. Larry? Yeah, I was like thinking the same because uh, I remember like the first time that I read uh, Memoirs of a Geisha and it was like impressive and I loved the book and everything. And like after that, I watched the movie. Well, I, I haven't watched the movie, but I watched like uh, the trailer and parts of the movie. And I started like to research uh, about the author, the, the writer and like the real story of the Geishas. And I found like the real story of the woman who inspired uh, that book and I realized that there was like so many uh, like mistakes in the book and everything so yeah I agree with the with this TED talk because like we need like to research more but also this is like a very good thing about literature because if you are interested like in one book and you can find like more books like related to uh, to this one and like the same like uh, like the characters and the, the geography of the book and where it's still developed and everything. So I think it's like uh, a really, really nice video. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Nubia? Okay, well, uh, I have seen this video before. I really love it. It's one of my favorite death talks. And uh, this uh, basically shows that we need to change our mind, but also we have to look for more information or looking for another thing that we or that usually we know, no? And she um, exemplified it very uh, light that bad ideas or bad conceptions can uh, became on discrimination or something like that. And it's that we have to change, no? Uh, I really think that it's basically, as you said it before, um, when you started the talk, it's very different what we know about feminism in Latin America, or it's very different about the feminism on Africa, on North America. So uh, I think that the, the big work to, that we have to do is looking for anything and try to change the things. Thank you very much, Nubia. That's quite insightful. Any other additions? 
do you feel that you uh, have a, a single story about any place or any community? Yeah. Okay. I, I would like someone who um, hasn't spoken yet uh, to share insights. Maybe I can pick volunteers. Me. Go ahead. Go ahead, Esther. Thank you. Yes. Well, it, it was a, a very impressive uh, video for me because I think that it reflects a lot of the uh, ideas that we have uh, around the world. For example, all that she said about um, the ideas on the United States of Africa. I think that it's a story that we have learned in many countries. So, but as well, uh, Mexican has um, Mexican have a, an idea of from in the United States as immigrants. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's very impressive and very important to understand that maybe we um, watch something on TV or um, some social or social um, how say and social networks yes and it's not true so sometimes we need as you said read about uh, all topics and know that there is not only a single story that it was um, I, I like it a lot thank you very much sir uh, here Nandi, you wanted to say something as well did I pronounce your um, name correctly? Go ahead. Me? How do I pronounce your name? How can I pronounce your uh, name? My name is Angel, but this is my last name, Hernandez. Sorry, okay. <laughs> well, uh, I think that all the countries have a certain type of uh, stereotypes that have to leave behind because the reality of the of the people it's very different just reading maybe traveling can give us a good cultural exchange that make us break those thoughts okay uh, can you explain further what you mean sorry uh, can you just explain further what you mean So you said we have to think more about communities or could you repeat what you just said? Um, maybe we can change the thought with okay. copyright change. Okay. So challenging these, um, you know, stereotypes, for example, right? Right. Great. So Frank just raised, uh, you just raised your hand, Frank. I know it is one o'clock. So um, is it okay to uh, just um, allow Frank to speak and then we can conclude maybe? I don't know what you think. I um, just want to say that what Angel means is that we need to like increase our knowledge or some or in some topics to right to really avoid these things, these stereotypes, and to learn about the history, what really is that place and that person's right now, and leave all that behind. Excellent. So getting to know communities and countries and uh, people better, at least. And perhaps use uh, certain analytical tools to think about uh, whatever we see, whatever we read about, and so on. So uh, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, I, you know, I would love to uh, sit here and, and converse with every one of you um, until 6 p.m. when I start teaching. <laughs> but we've come to the end of our session. So over to you, um, Professor uh, Juarez. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, Nada Mustafa Ali, it's been a wonderful conversation. And let me just give another last thought to all our uh, uh, Puma friends. Um, we tend not to accept that there are racism issues in Mexico. 
and we tend not to accept that we don't have only two roots, the Spanish and the native Mexicans, the Indios, but also the African root. Uh, if you look at my mother, uh, she could be identified as African American in the US and just look at my nose. I'm very proud of my uh, African roots, but uh, many people have problems in Mexico with that. We don't even like to use black or African. We say moreno or prieto or whichever euphemism. So explore and embrace also diversity within each one of you, within your family, within your friends. And in exploring that diversity, you will enrich your lives. Thank you so much. And I mean, this is really so important. We need to continue this conversation. So um, I look forward to seeing you in person very, very soon. Likewise, and what you just said applies to Sudan as well. You know, we have internal racism as well. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. thank you very much. And thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your bye. day. Bye. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. bye.